Good evening. My name is Farah Hussain and I'm one of the Medics Academy and FDOCS team members. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing our speciality webinar speaker, Dr. Abigail Falola. Dr. Falola is an Obzangani ST1 and we will be talking you through in her talk titled Survival Guide for Obzangani, Things Every SHO Should Know, an introduction to her specialty and how she has picked up a few tricks since starting training. I hope you learn from her experience and very much enjoy her talk. Hello, my name is Dr. Abigail Falola. I am an ONG trainee in the east of England, and I'm essentially going to do a presentation on how you, on the things that I wish I knew when I was starting ONG way back when. So it's going to be a quick stop tour. I recognize I'm not going very deep into anything. This is just kind of a preparation for when you start your first placement on ONG, things that you should know that will make your life a little bit easier so that you're not just thrown into the deep end because some inductions and some trusts are amazing and some are leave a little bit to be desired. So this is kind of something for you to go through on your own accord and um, take your time with. And then at least that will give you a nice basis. So when you start, you don't feel as panicky and oh my goodness, things are um, going wrong kind of thing. And you kind of know a little bit of what to expect, all right? So. A little bit about me, my journey. So, uh, like I said, I'm currently an Obson Guiding trainee in the East of England, specifically in Ipswich Hospital at this very present time. But um, I didn't start my journey here. I trained in St. George's in London, which was amazing, but then I went all the way out to Devon and um, I did loads of jobs there. And one of the um, jobs that I did actually was Obson Guiding. And initially I wasn't really interested in Obson Guiding, but my FG placement was so good that um, I kind of changed my mind and I was convinced. So, um, that's a little bit, and then I did various other things and um, took my time and then ended up here. So um, I really enjoy Obson Guiding, obviously, because I picked it, but um, some of you might be a little bit undecided at this point. Some of you might be at various stages of your journey. You might have chosen Obson Guiding and you're at the point now where you're like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? Um, and then heading into ST1 training, or you might be a foundation doctor and you've ended up with Dobson Guiding, you never really expected to do it, you never really wanted to do it, and it's all just kind of happening to you, and you're thinking, oh goodness, I, I haven't looked at a vagina medically in so long, I don't know what's going on, so you might not expect to enjoy it, I definitely didn't expect to enjoy it, but I really did, and now I've changed my life choices, so I do encourage any of you to give it a chance if you're very undecided and just come into it a bit like you go into any other job and see how much you can enjoy it because you might be like me. Right, so that's a quick stop about me. Aims and objectives that we're going to talk about is we're gonna do a recap of the um, female reproductive organs. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this talk, you'll be able to have a generalized understanding of UK antenatal care. I know everybody's covered this in medical school and I, I'm very aware of that, but for some of you, medical school might be a good long time away. And so for some of you might have just come out of medical school and you're thinking, I don't need this talk. But this is just a quick recap for those of you who are like me, who might have forgotten all the basics that you learn in um, third or fourth year in medical school. Um, you should be able to manage common presentations in obstetrics on calls that you will do. I'm aiming this more at the obstetric core trainee who is uh, F2 or ST1 just starting. Um, you might be an F1 and depending on your hospital, whether you're a tertiary centre or a district general, things might be a little bit different. So this is a very general view and I've worked in different centres. I've worked in, I'm currently working in a district general, but I worked previously in a tertiary centre. So things might be very, very different. And obviously that's the whole point of the trust induction. But I'm just going to talk about the things that are generally the same everywhere. And then obviously you fill in the gaps. You should be able to um, 
I want to talk a little bit about gynecology, just a few bits and pieces, um, specifically ectopic pregnancies and things like that. I'm not going to do a deep dive into gynae. It's going to be mainly obstetrics, actually, and just a little bit of gynae thrown in there for um, those of you who might not have any other chance to do recaps of emergencies in gynae. All right. So jump right in. Quick anatomy recaps. So it's probably been a while for quite a few of you, but we're going to, so hopefully you can see my pointer. So just a quick look at from the bottom end of the bed when a woman lies down and you're about to do an examination, um, just a quick recap of the anatomy. So the you can see the anus up and looking at the picture towards the right hand of the screen, which would be um, number five. You're looking at the anus at the bottom and then vagina in the middle and then the top, the external urethral orifice and then the clitoris above. Now, this is one of the things that most junior doctors do and it's happened at least once to a lot of people where they're looking at the clitoris thinking that it's the external urethral orifice. So the clitoral hood is always above the external urethral orifice. So the best way to do it is look for the clitoris because it's usually the most prominent and just below it should be um, the external urethral orifice and just below it sometimes um, touched quite deeply is the um, external vagina. So things to mention is the Bartholin glands and you can see it's um, quite handy and pointed to. So the Bartholin glands you will notice sometimes when you have your gyne on call that you're asked to see big swellings around where the Bartholin glands um, opening should be and those are Bartholin cysts usually and um, just recognize that if the swellings are not on either side of the um, a vaginal orifice then they're usually actually not Bartholin cysts so any other swellings that are not around that area or egg site they're usually like small eggs and quite um, hard and mobile and quite painful for women um, but any other swelling that isn't there generally isn't that and you can have perineal abscesses and things like that but it's just a quick thing just to say the Bartholin openings of the glands are there and for those of you who are lucky enough to get to do word catheters or things like that that's kind of where you're aiming for. So um, looking from a side view of the body and if you cut the body in half just straight down the middle like that and turn um, this is um, picture six and we're going to go through the bits and, and pieces there. So you can see the rectum and um, the um, vaginal canal and also the urethra are kind of right next to each other. And everything's quite close in um, female organs. And it's something to kind of bear in mind when you're seeing women, because sometimes you will get um, people who are presented with um, vaginal bleeding, especially postmenopausal, and actually it's not coming from the vagina at all. It's actually coming from um, the bladder, ure urethra, things like that. So just bear that in mind always. And also bear in mind things like UTIs. The bladder is literally just right under and in front of the um, of the uterus. So bladder irritation can often sometimes cause issues with the uterus as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on when we start to talk about um, threatened preterm labor and things like that. So um, when you're doing cesarean sections, you'll be going straight through the top and you'll likely be assisting with registrars or senior SHOs, even or consultants doing cesarean sections. If, especially if you're a core trainee and you're doing an emergency ops on call, usually you would be assisting with that. So um, this side view is just a quick recap of things that to be aware of and just so you have a little bit of an idea of what to expect because it might be a really long time since you've actually seen um, the female reproductive organs like this, especially if your um, medical school placement left something to be desired. All right, so moving on. So antenatal care, how does it work in the UK? So very brief history of the NHS. Um, so the NHS was born after the um, Second World War and um, we realised at that point we really do need care for all and things are very different. And antenatal care came very quickly with the birth of the NHS and we started talking about it in 1948. 
and it really became a prominent thing. And the whole purpose of antenatal care is to identify issues that can present later on in pregnancy and manage them early with the hopes of the better you manage your antenatal care, the better your pregnancy outcomes for both children and mothers and all along that. So with the birth of the NHS, then came the Cranbrook Report, which was talking about obstetric care. So previously, that most people recognised that they're midwives and they tended to manage everything. Um, and obstetric care was very kind of limited. And then there was this big push for obstetric care to be more in hospital because you had a better chance of managing any complications. And then at that point, they were saying we should aim for 70% of births in hospital. And then came the Peel report, which had 100% of births should be in hospital because hospital was the safest place because if anything went wrong in labor, a woman could have quick access and then there was ultrasound technology introduced in the 1970s and again with the idea of trying to identify problems in the antenatal period that can cause issues later on and manage them. So along with that it then came this big drive and this big push for um, consultant-led and doctor-led antenatal care. And the idea of reducing perinatal and maternity mortality and um, postpartum stillbirth. So we're talking about induction of labours and things like that. Then there was a big campaign after the 1970s, and especially one of the most prominent um, obstetricians at the time, Wendy Savage, came after that. And there was this big push to, of course, improve antenatal care, but there's this pushback of saying that actually we really do need to separate out these women. We need to identify women who are very low risk and identify the women at high risk. So that brings me on to the next slide of talking about antenatal care. So now we come to where we are today. And where we are today is generally all pregnant women receive antenatal care. And we try and risk stratify them very early for women who are may have issues later on in pregnancy who are high risk and women who are low risk. Generally low risk women will be managed by midwives and we will call them midwife led care and some people um, <laughs> coming into the specialty often mistake midwives for nurses and they're very 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 different entities and they do very different things. So midwives can completely and will completely manage pregnancy that is low risk and doesn't have any need for any doctor intervention and they will manage that all on their own. Whereas later on if there are issues identified at this 10-week booking appointment they can become consultant-led care and consultant-led care is that idea of the midwives are still very much involved but they're women that are maybe more higher risk, maybe they have big EMIs or previous issues in previous pregnancy, and we need to do certain things to reduce the risk of problems in labor or make plans for labor. So there are things that are done in the booking appointment and that tends to be all the things above, you want me to read them out, and all these things then stratify them as a consultant or midwife let care. So all women get a dating scan and they'll get an anomaly scan at 20 weeks. Some trusts routinely also do a 36 week scan, but all women in the country will definitely have a 12 week scan and a 20 week scan. Now, if there is issues identified or risk factors for women developing issues, they can also get growth scans. So CLC would be consultant at care and they can sometimes get growth scans. They can have the growth scans at 28 weeks, 32 weeks and 36 weeks, or even more scans than that, depending on the issues identified. So every woman will have obstetric notes, which are separate from her hospital notes. They might be online and they might be all electronic in the snazzier, more <laughs> hospitals that have a little bit more money. And um, in some dinky little DGHs, they actually might have paper notes and things like that. So. A good thing to do on your first day is familiarise yourself with what the obstetric notes look like in your area, because then each area is different. Right, so things that I will mention. So in the previous slide, I talked about um, risk stratification. And one of the things that they, we do identify as risks is um, particularly STIs in pregnancy. They're a little bit different and they're managed a little bit different because of the fact that they can cause problems for the baby and they can cause a lot of issues for the mother. 
So this slide is more for you to go through on your own time, but we talk about syphilis. So syphilis is not something you probably see commonly, but depending on your area in England, some things are, would be far more common and um, you might see syphilis. And you, or you might not ever even come across it and think, goodness, this is fair health medicine, but it is something that does happen. And there is risks associated with it. Um, stillbirth, preterm labor, low birth weight, um, infant infection, um, OVN, ophthalmia neonatorum, is a essentially an eye infection of the baby, which then can later on lead to um, blindness. And if you think about it, the baby's passing through the vaginal um, canal as they're coming out, it's a way to get out unless they're having a C-section, obviously. So imagine whatever's in the mother's vagina, the baby very easily picks up. And so um, in some women who've got really terrible, terrible situations like secondary syphilis and things like that, people might end up doing a C-section. That's very complicated stuff. But from your perspective, in terms of pregnant women and STIs, these are the things that we do and these are the things that we manage. So the other thing that worries people a lot with pregnancy is what drugs to give them because you're like oh my goodness I don't want to give them something that's going to cause a problem later on in pregnancy so things along that um along that line just check I always say check with whoever is um more senior to you because they'll this is something they'll dispense a lot more but these are the relatively common things um bacterial vaginosis we always treat in pregnancy um um, um chlamydia we always treat is it from ice and get traps and things like that so those are things to be aware of. Right, let's talk about first trimester issues. So this is things in secondary care. So most places will have an early pregnancy ambulatory unit. They might call it something different. They might call it, they might have all sorts of names, but essentially what it is an early pregnancy ambulatory unit, EPAU for short. Um, some smaller DGHs might not necessarily have one, but they would do the same thing. They just might not have enough um, patients in the area to warrant a whole unit, but they will do the same care I talked about. So again, at your induction, at your trust induction, it's important that you find out what exactly what exact services that your trust runs, because it will help you a lot. They're usually managed by um, specialist nurses, um, sonographers and um, gynae consultants slash registrars and um, it's a little bit different in office and gynae for most specialties in the sense that we tend to do a lot of our own scanning so you might find that you don't actually have sonographers and actually what you'll have is a gynae consultant or registrars running scanning lists which is um, generally one of the things that happens in the smaller hospitals or in a tertiary unit for very specialized patients so they perform early pregnancy scans, and sometimes they're kind of attached together with an um, emergency gynecology unit. So they'll say EPAU slash EGAU. Either way, they kind of run as one unit. And they will often have scan appointments and non-scan appointments. And the non-scan appointments will often do like serial monitoring of beta HCGs for patients with pregnancy of unknown location and things like that but we'll come on to that a little bit later. But they'll have scan appointments for early pregnancy scans. And their purpose at that point is identifying patients, making sure they have an intrauterine pregnancy and seeing if there's any issues. So for example, trophoblastic disease or things, uh, or things like that. They generally perform transvaginal or transabdominal scanning. Generally for very early pregnancy scans, it's transvaginal um, because of the fact that Baby's very small, and the things you're trying to identify sometimes can be quite difficult if you're going straight over the abdomen. Usually, in early pregnancy scans, they usually ask for a full bladder, and that's just one of those things to be um, just to be aware of. They might ask you to come in and see um, things like Bartholin glands or perinatal um, perineal abscesses or sometimes just to perform a speculum in early pregnancy bleeding. It's very dependent on what the nurses are trained to do as to what they'll call you for. So each unit is very different. Right, so one of the problems that can happen and you do hear a lot about is nausea and vomiting in early pregnancy or hyperemesis. Now, nausea and vomiting in early pregnancy is incredibly common. Very common, most women have it. Most women actually will settle pretty well with um, 
managing it at home, they will be able to at least um, reduce their intake. So probably have very small meals, little and often is what I tend to say to them and um, constantly drink through the day or their nausea and, preg and, nausea will, and um, vomiting will last very much in the morning and then by afternoon they'll be okay. Most women are like that. Some women start to develop hyperemesis. So hyperemesis will tend to present with weight loss. They can have electrolyte imbalances because of the constant vomiting, particularly they do get hypokalemia because they're losing all their gastric salts from their um, stomach. And sometimes if it's really bad and they've been consistently vomiting, they can present with a little bit of hematemesis. That's generally quite rare but electrolyte imbalances tend to be relatively common. So they can get a hyponatremia and severe hyponatremia. They can get central pontine um, myelosis, but generally I've never actually seen that in all my years in a pregnant woman, because usually we get in before that starts developing, but they can develop quite severe thiamine deficiency. So that's something to think about. All women, should have a urinalysis. So all pregnant women always have a urine dip. It's just one of the things that screens so many things. We really do believe in the urine dip. But what you will see is ketones because they're starved essentially because they're not able to get anything in orally. So they're very, very starved. So they'll have ketones in their urine. Three pluses, four pluses generally warrant IV fluids and IV antiemetics. Most of these women don't need to stay in hospital overnight. They just need a bag of fluid or two and some IV and sickness naturally. Or I am, and actually tend to manage things quite well. Once you kind of break the cycle, they tend to get better. So you do a urine um, sample, always um, do a urine dip for nitrites. If there is a UTI in pregnancy, you, you really should always treat it. Um, and always send it off to the lab anyway, because you want to make sure that you've given the right antibiotics. Consider um, thyroid function tests, consider liver function tests, because any thyroid problems, particularly hypothyroidism, can present and cause issues and can be a trigger for hyperemesis. And they can go on to develop hypothyroidism if they haven't had it before or pick it up. So there is a lot of issues that we tend to pick up in early pregnancy with young women that they never had before because they never really needed to see a doctor. So if you think about it, most young people generally fit and well. This is one of the things about Ops and Gynae that's very different from most areas in a hospital. Most people see us for a good reason, particularly in obstetrics, and most women are well. So generally, you can pick up issues that have been long-standing issues in, in women that they've never really known about before. So it's a really good idea to make sure you screen for things. If they've not had a previous ultrasound, you should get them an ultrasound. Reason being, especially if they've got quite severe hyperemesis, you need to start thinking about other things such as multiple pregnancies. So twins are more likely to have um, hyperemesis and molar pregnancies. Now there has been talk of the reason that, of that being that they excrete a lot of beta-HCG and that is what essentially causes the hyperemesis. I mean, it's anyone's guess. There are a lot of risk factors. People with quite severe mental health conditions tend to present, they do tend to have um, hyperemesis and various things like that. So you should always do an ultrasound scan just to make sure that they're not missing anything. Um, so IV fluids, antiemetics. So generally, so recently we started avoiding on Danzatron in the first trimester, but it's, it's okay in the second trimester. Um, stematil, I am stematil, works a treat definitely for a lot of these women, um, but buccal propyl perazine works really well because it didn't need to swallow it. And it was very good for breaking the cycle. Metoclopramide works really well, cyclozine. Thiamine supplementation is always a good idea, especially if they're an inpatient. And if they're constipated, it's worth giving them laxatives. Just because you think about it, severe constipation just makes everything backed up. Their gut is unhappy and it's very well worth making sure that they're still going. If they're unresponsive to treatment in the first trimester, and if it gets quite severe with severe weight loss, and you can do a peak score, peak score, most um, units will have like a, a 
an admission document which will have it on then you can consider steroids and some women have it so awful that they actually have to have a term, termination of pregnancy in the first trimester so it is something that can really affect patients and women's lives and it's worth us treating very well so in if it's persisting into the second and third trimester and it's quite severe they will often have steroids and they need growth scans because if you imagine the woman is malnourished the baby will not be big and they often have very small babies and in severe cases they do need the nutrition team and I've even seen patients on parental feeding for a long time because of hyperemesis so it can get really bad right moving on so bleeding in the first trimester anybody who's been an often gynae SHO has dealt with this to the nth degree and by the time you've finished however long your placement is there. So if you're in F2, four months, or GP training, four to six months, my goodness, you will be sick to the teeth of bleeding in the first trimester. It is very common. It is not always a miscarriage, but the common causes are miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, gestational trophoblastic disease. I'm not going to talk about it. It's quite rare and it's not quite common. Lower tract pathology. So if you think about it, going back, to the slides about, um, about the anatomy, you, if you imagine bleeding comes down, it can come from anywhere like the vaginal walls, inside the vagina, the cervix, or higher up coming from the uterus. Um, you can get tropians, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you a picture of an tropian and talk about what that is, and um, cervical polyps protruding down, that all happens. And I'm going to mention that cervical cancer. It seems a bit mad, but you do pick up cervical cancer in pregnancy and it can sometimes present with bleeding. If you do a speculum and the cervix doesn't look normal, have a low threshold for sending them to colposcopy. All hospitals will have a colposcopy service and colposcopy, they will take a closer look at the cervix and they can spray some dye and just take a good look at it. It's not going to cost you anything. And there are women who we have picked up cervical cancer in pregnancy. So it is well worth any woman with a suspicious looking cervix, do send them to colposcopy or speak to your registrar and they'll tell you what to do, but usually they'll go to colposcopy. Right, so this is the end of it. When you put a speculum in and you're looking at the um, end of the vagina, which is the cervix, and you can see the redness there, that's the cervical ectropion. It's a bit blurry on this screen. I'm really sorry, it's all blown up. Um, but essentially it's that redness. And what's happening is the cells on the inside are migrating outwards from the, in from the influence of a lot of pumping with estrogen and progesterone, which is what happens in normal pregnancy. The vicolectropians are completely normal, but they can cause some bleeding in early pregnancy, particularly spotting after sex. So if you do see a cervix that looks a little bit like that, it's not something that you should panic about. It's just cervicolectropian and it will come and go as it pleases, all right? So let's talk about miscarriages. So that's a big presentation that comes in a lot. And when women present to you with bleeding in early pregnancy, most of them are thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose my baby. And it's something that it's really frightening for a woman, especially if she's not had a miscarriage before. By the time you've finished your placement, you will have seen a lot of it. You will see a lot of women having it because first trimester miscarriages are very, very common. And for you, you're going to see it, you're sick to the teeth of it. Not all women need admissions, and we're going to talk about what happens. So early miscarriage, you can have a threatened miscarriage. This is when there's bleeding and the cervical os, which is, let's say that looks like a donut and a donut hole, <laughs> the cervical os is open. Now open is when it's actually open. Now this is a cervix that looks like actually a paracervice. It looks like somebody who's had a baby already. It's what we call a paracervix. And you, this is normal. This is a normal closed cervix. An open cervix is a lot bigger than that. And sometimes you can see things coming out. So if there's, if there's bleeding and the os is closed, it's threatened. And that means could be about to miscarry, could not be. We need to see, we need to see what's going to happen. If it's complete, they've had the big bleed, they've passed products of conception, they've miscarried their baby and the os is closed. 
If it's incomplete, they will still be bleeding. Maybe they've already passed some products, but not all of them. And the os can be open, the os can be closed. Now, the bleeding will persist. The uterus is very clever and they tend to continue bleeding until they finish their miscarriage. So be wary of a woman who's got persistent heavy bleeding. Um, they've had a scan that said, mm, can't see a fetal heart. And there's supposed to be something like 12 weeks and actually all you can see is the sun. Those are the women who are probably miscarrying and it's probably incomplete. All right. Um, missed miscarriages when the cervix is closed, We've scanned them and you can see a sack and I say they're supposed to be eight weeks and there's no heartbeat. All right. There is pregnancy of unknown viability. So if you scan a woman too early, you can see like a, a gestational sack but you're not necessarily seeing a heartbeat. It might be that you scan the woman away too early. And for most of those women in those situations, we'd give it two weeks and we'd rescan them again and see what happens. If you still can't see a heartbeat and things kind of declare themselves at that point, that would be okay. They've got a missed miscarriage or, or whatever. But if they're, when you're scanning them too early, you can have what we call a pregnancy of unknown viability. I don't know which way this is going to go. A pregnancy of unknown location is when you scan them and the uterus is empty. Now, for those women, it could be that the pregnancy is implanted in the, in the um, tubes. And for that would be an ectopic pregnancy. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But essentially, that is a non-viable pregnancy. But sometimes you can't see it in the uterus and it's not big enough. So you can't quite see it in the tubes yet. And that's a pregnancy of unknown location. We scanned you, but we don't quite know exactly where this pregnancy is. So investigations that you should do for all of these women is you should, especially if they present with bleeding, is they should have baseline bloods. Make sure you do a HB and make sure they're stable. If they're heavily bleeding, soaking pads, clots like egg, egg ball golf ball size clots they need admission because you need to keep an eye on them because they might you can lose a huge amount of blood from a miscarriage and at that situation we might need to intervene generally we try our, our best to kind of let the body do what it's going to do and let the body complete its miscarriage but if they're he hemorrhaging we can't just say oh we're just going to wait no we need to take this one to theatres we need to do something so you need a HB to see where you are. Um, a beta HCG, we do that because what we expect is that a rise of two thirds if we repeat that beta HCG in four hours, in not four hours, in <laughs> 48 hours. And so you do one beta HCG now, you do a beta HCG in two days later. So you should see that. But if it's not doing that, it's likely that the patient is miscarrying or you're thinking, actually, is this an ectopic pregnancy? So if you've got an empty uterus and a suboptimal rise in the beta HCG, you should really start thinking, oh, is this pregnancy of unknown location? Progesterone are quite useful. Some trusts are big on progesterone, some trusts are not big on progesterone. Generally, a progesterone of over 50 is usually a viable pregnancy. But let's see, it's, it's something that you only do a one-off for, but the beta HCG is the gold standard and that's what we usually do. Now, speculum and a high vaginal swab. We do a high vaginal swab because we want to make sure that this woman doesn't have an infection. An ultrasound, if the fetal heart is not visible, you might need to wait a little bit longer because the dates might be off. Now, the management, like I said, is expectant generally, but you might need to do a medical, especially if it's a missed miscarriage, you might need to give them some misoprostol to help them pass the bullets, and that would be a medical management. A surgical management, of a missed miscarriage would be a manual vacuum aspiration or a surgical ERPC where you put them to sleep and you pass a suction catheter through the cervix and suck up everything in the cervix. Um, and if they've had a lot of miscarriages, they will probably need to be seen by a consultant and make a plan for recurrent miscarriage follow-up. Psychological support, these women are absolutely heartbroken. A lot of them have maybe had a lot of miscarriages and been trying for a baby for a really long time, or it's very unexpected for them. They've had three kids already and they're just absolutely heartbroken. Most trusts will have a bereavement midwife and they will have a pathway for referring these women. Please, 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 if you see them and you think, and they're very open to support, please refer them. So like I said, flooding, bleeding, 
um, pads, flooding pads and bleeding with large clots, like golf ball sized clots, you might need to think about admitting them. Now I'm going to mention cervical shock. So the vagus nerve supplies the cervix in a roundabout way, but the nerve supply of the cervix is amazing. And it means that if there's a big, big clot sitting in the cervix or big product sitting in the cervix, sometimes these women go into cervical shock. They go pale, it's like a proper vasovagal. They, they keel over, they're very, very pale. Their blood pressure drops, their heart rate drops. The treatment for that is remove whatever is in the cervix. It's almost like a resurrection. Most of them will feel so much better once you remove whatever's in the cervix. So do a speculum, with a sponge hold with forceps, pull out what's in the cervix. Because at that point, and at that point, you're not doing anything essentially, like you're not, you're not doing a termination or anything. At that point, everything that's happening is already happening and you're just trying to get them to feel better. So if they're having a huge bleed, you can consider misoprostol, syntometrin, or syntocin on some hospitals give it, because if they've had multiple babies, they might have some oxytocin receptors and they actually will get their uterus to contract but they need a senior review. You're gonna need help. If they're having a big hemorrhage, you're going to need help from your registrar. Right, ectopic pregnancy is just a quick mention. These are things that I mentioned. So every woman who's pregnant with abdominal pain who hasn't had a scan is a, is a, an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. You would have done this in medical school. This is just a quick recap. Pain, shoulder tip pain, dizziness, collapse, Sometimes they have bowel disturbance, especially when they've ruptured and they get peritonism. They tend to tell you they've got diarrhea, they'll have or they'll feel awful, they'll be curled up in pain, they will not be able to, um, they will not be able to sit still, they're in agony. Um, that tends to be ruptured ectopics, and that's an emergency. Do a speculum if you can, and if it's not causing the woman too much pain, and see for survival exit. Um, excitation and add an extra mass. Sometimes it's visible if it's quite corker, you can sometimes see it. Um, and any tenderness as well. Risk factors, assisted conception, and um, PID is a big risk factor, pelvic inflammatory disease, so previous gonorrhea or chlamydia, previous ectopic is a huge risk factor because we know already that that tube is sluggish and or, or it has some obstruction or a blockage and actually that might be something that that person needs to have that tube out. Um, or they've gotten pregnant on the coil. Pregnancy on the coil is a lot, of, a lot of them do get ectopic, so it's something to think about. So if suspected IV access, bloods including group and save and cross match, make a meal by mouth and call a senior. These women can get very sick and they can lose a lot of blood very quickly. So they might need to go to theatres right then and there. All right. Um, get them hemodynamically stable, do a beta HCG level along with the bloods and um, assess for free fluid, tenderness and they're suitable for follow-up. So you can do an expectant rise and that's for those pregnancy of unknown locations. This is all managed heavily by the consultant. It's not gonna be you making this decision because there's a lot of risk involved and we don't want, we don't play with these women. We don't want to um, get it wrong. So you can get the methotrexate if, depending on the size of the ectopic and um, how much your beta HCG is. Um, but it's a consultant decision and it's, um, it's a very specialist dose. Um, they need reliable contraception. We don't want these women falling pregnant again. We want to sort them out and not don't let them fall pregnant again. So they often have a big contraception chat. chat. And if they obviously are um, ruptured ectopic or it's too big for the us to manage by a methotrexate, we take them to a laparoscopy. And sometimes we need to take the tube and sometimes, or sometimes we can just put the out. And nine times out of 10, we'll need to take the whole tube. They're resource negative, they need MTG. Right, let's talk about rhesus status. So um, there was a million different ways that we, um, there's a million different antibodies that you can have in your blood. But the big one that we talk about is rhesus status. So your rhesus negative or rhesus positive. Rhesus negative mothers are at risk of having um, hemolytic disease of the newborn in their next pregnancy. It's not about this pregnancy, because what happens is if their baby is rhesus positive and your rhesus negative mother, the baby, you and if the baby has some sort of um if there is a bleed and there is a leak of fetal cells into the maternal blood circulation the maternal blood circulation will recognize that and treat it as an uh, as a pathogen and you will stimulate the immune response 
it's not this pregnancy that will cause problems and generally it's the next pregnancy. So we give them anti-D to mop up any fetal cells that might have leaked into um, the maternal circulation. And we do that generally to just try and make sure that anything that has happened, nine times out of 10, they won't have had, if they've had a small bleed, it won't need it, but we give it because we want to make sure that in their next pregnancy, they don't have issues. So um, guidelines generally are in less than 12 weeks um, gestation, it's only if they're having, if they have an ectopic pregnancy that, or a molar pregnancy, or they have a surgical termination, or there's heavy uterine bleeding, and I mean heavy, or, and that's generally a consultant decision. If it's less than 12 weeks and a resource negative mother, we give them anti-D. Between 12 to 20 weeks. So generally, a lot of places have now have this CFF DNA, which essentially tests the resource status of the baby. So if the baby's resource positive, mum needs anti-D. If the baby's resource negative, just like mum, fine it's not going to be an issue they don't, they don't necessarily need anti-d and that well, since we we that was introduced around 2014 2015 and actually that has reduced the amount of women who need anti-d because once we test baby we can figure out where they lie but for women who have resource positive babies they are going to need anti-d um it's for any sensitizing event and sensitizing event like a bleed or um or maybe they're in a car accident or things like that trauma fall or anything like that and that should be administered between 12 to 20 weeks if they've had a sensitizing event if not they should definitely have it between 28 and 30 weeks this will be generally managed by the midwives that's just something for you to be aware of because if you see these patients always remember resource negative oh should i be giving them an all right a Clyde Howard blood test is just to me measure how much fetal and blood has leaked into the um, maternal circulation, and that's taken from the mother and sent to the lab, and they will issue anti-D. Right, so antenatal common presentations after 20 weeks. So most places will have a maternity triage or antenatal day unit, which is run by the midwives, and they're amazing. They do everything mostly but they can call you to see patients for different reasons it's a bit like a pregnant woman a &E, I guess um in the sense that it has they do initial observations urine dips and ctgs which is a monitoring for baby for anyone over 26 weeks is what when we do a ctg sometimes it's really difficult actually um because when the baby's really small it's quite hard to get the monitor on them but any CTG concerns generally goes to a registrar because as an FHO, we wouldn't expect you to go for that. Obviously, you can take a look and you can your opinion, but just, just generally, it's a blanket rule in your mind. It goes to a registrar or an obstetric trainee because we don't expect you generally as an FHO, as a F2 or anything like that to deal with that type of thing. Um, common presentations generally are reduced fetal movement, bleeding in pregnancy, abdominal pain, headaches, um, suspected preeclampsia, BIH, query labor, or sometimes they actually seem so, particularly triage, technically a, a woman is still under maternity care up to 28 days after they've delivered. So you can see some postnatals and you see them for query retained projects of conception. Maybe they've got an, um, a really bad infection of their um, episiotomy or perineal repair or things like that. So Bleeding in early pregnancy. I'm going to go back to the bleeding topic, but we're going to look at it from after 20 weeks. So we have provoked versus unprovoked, painless versus painful. I tend to think if it's painful, bleeding, it's always an emergency. If it's really bad pain and bleeding, it's always an emergency. And that, you need your registrar. You really do. So call the registrar early if it's looking like it's going to be something you can't manage. Because a lot of the management for um, the painful bleeding things involves taking them to theatres. You're not really going to be making that decision, are you? So painful bleeding causes are abruption, and they can be partially concealed or they can be revealed. Um, uterine rupture, and that's where the uterus quite literally ruptures. Painful bleeding in, is painless bleeding can be ectopics, vasa previa, or placenta previa. So a minor antepartum hemorrhage is less than 50 mils, major is 50 to 1000, and massive is greater than 1000. Red flags, severe abdominal pain, like I said, bleeding greater than 50 mils is something that you should really always speak to your, your um, registrar about at the very least. Um, Known low-lying low placenta or vasa previa. 
So vasa previa is where the fetal cells are lying either close or over the um, cervical os. Now, the reason why this matters is because when the baby, when the when there's bleeding, it's not coming from the mum; it's coming from the baby. Baby's tiny. Baby can lose. Baby can exsanguinate in a relatively small amount of bleeding. So that's why vasa previa is a big thing because you need to get them, you can't allow them to bleed because baby doesn't have a lot of blood to lose. So um, that's always a red flag. If you're known vasa previa and the presenting is bleeding, they need to be seen by a registrar. Nine times out of 10, the midwives won't even call you about that, they go straight to work. So all these things. Um, so no line, low line percent or placenta previa, again, they can bleed. So placenta previa is when they, um, the placenta is very close to the cervical os and it will and they bleed. So days of previous when the baby like cord is running close to the os or the baby's um circulation is running close to the os, whereas um placenta previa is where the placenta is close to the os, is attached close to the os or is covering the os. They have um if it's an abruption, the the medical school answer, they have a tense for the abdomen and they're bleeding and it's usually dark blood when you do the speculum. Um, if they're vasa previa, like I said, fetal exsanguination. Management is always A, B, C, D, E. Your med school um, basics always, always approach any woman like that. If they have, if you do a speculum and you see it's just tiny spots of blood coming from a um, cervical atropium, that's not a worry. But if you're having bleeding and you can see fresh blood in the cervical canal and they're still and in the vaginal canal and they're still coming from the cervix, these women need admission because sometimes you can have what we call a herald bleed where they have a small bleed and then they have a big bleed. Some women, we don't know why they're bleeding. We never know. They don't have any, maybe their placenta is supposed to be in the right place. We just don't know why they're bleeding, but they do have bleeding persistently in pregnancy. They need a large pool cannula, green or gray, generally gray. Um, and they need bloods taken, full blood count, group and save, clotting. And if there's a large amount of bleeding, like I said, the speculum might be better well suited done by a registrar. And just think about that. Just think about it. If it's something that needs immediate management, it might be that the speculum should be done by the registrar. But just have a think about it. Always have a chat with your registrar about at the beginning of the shift, especially if you're when you're starting about what they prefer, what they like, because it's always a good idea, because then you know the team that you're working with. The centre previa, um, depending on the situation, will be managed with an emergency C-section or we just keep an eye on them. Vasa previa is usually always an emergency C-section if it's a significant amount of bleeding, um, and that's because of the previous reason I explained, and abruption. Or uterine rupture means an emergency C section. So you can see why it's called the register registrar early. Threatened preterm labor, abdominal pain with unpalpable uterine activity. So um, this sometimes you can get a bloody show. It's, it's when the cervix kind of pops open, it does have a little bit of bleeding. So they might present and saying, Oh, I've got this cramping bearing down, tightening pain, and I feel like baby's coming down, and I've also had a bleed, and you go down, you go specky, and you're like, oh, that. nine times out of ten, that doesn't happen to you, but it has happened to me once, um, so the abdominal pain with palp palpable uterine activity, you can get a bloody show, like I said, or a mucus plug with a little bit of blood in it, urine dip, if it's pre, so preterm labor is before 38 weeks, but there's between 36 and 38 weeks, it's not too bad but before 36 weeks there needs a lot because it's slightly worrying there's some things that you need doing but we'll talk about that in a second so they need a urine dip if they've got a really bad uti because remember going back to our anatomy the bladder is at the front and the uterus is behind if the bladder is really irritable it will irritate what's right next to it so they can get uterine irritability and threaten preterm labor if they've got horrendous uti or they're septic so always, always, always treat UTIs. Fetal fibronectin. So it's essentially when you do a speculum, you will test for the presence of fetal fibronectin. The higher the fetal fibronectin, the more likely this person is to go into labor. It's used between um, 22 weeks to 35 plus five weeks gestation. Some units use it earlier and you use the quick um, the org app to calculate the likelihood of preterm labor. 
anything over five percent so the, they'll they'll say the likelihood of a person going into labor within one week is and they'll give you a percentage anything over five percent is higher risk um and but there are some reason, ways that you can't use it it is invalid if there is a presence of bleeding because that it alters the test and it doesn't allow for an accurate test or if the waters have gone so you can't do a fetal fibrinectin if the patient has known rupture of membranes or they've been PV bleeding. Some trusts and some consultants don't necessarily mind. Technically, they say you shouldn't really do it if a woman has had um, sexual intercourse within the last 24 hours. But some people kind of you know, don't really worry too much about that. But definitely, if the waters have gone and if there's bleeding, the fetal fibronectin is not valid. If they are threatened preterm labour, so it looks like they're um, they're going into labour, there's things that we do. So if they're under 34 weeks, this is very early, and they need steroids. Now, steroids is not for the mother. Steroids is for the baby. Steroids is to help to mature baby's lungs, and they're given, depending on how much time you think you're going to have, either 12 or 24 hours apart, they are often given mad sulfate, um, that's something that you probably, if you've only worked in medicine, you only see really used for like severe asthma attacks. But mag sulfate is good for fetal um, neuroprotection and it reduces the risk of um, babies developing cerebral palsy. Antibiotics, because sepsis, like I mentioned, is an often a cause of threatened preterm labor. And actually, if you can treat the, per the woman, sometimes things kind of just stop. And depending on where you are, you know, might need tocolytics. So that's things like tozaban, mifedipine, to try and stop the uterine contractions. Because if the baby is 28 weeks and your um, pediatric service don't do 28 weeks, you need to get this woman out of here with a tertiary center. So um, they might need tocolytics. But again, you're not going to be making that decision, but it's just good to have a good idea of what should be going on. All right. Um, if they're 34 to 36 weeks, they're usually just given um, steroids. And they try and we try and do it generally 24 hours apart. And antibiotics if there's evidence of infection. All right. So magnesium sulfate is given as a loading dose and it's given as an infusion. The loading dose in some hospitals is required to be given by a doctor and then the infusion is just run. So it depends. If it is, if you do need to give the loading dose, you give it in aliquots. That's what we call it essentially where um, we give just, um, it's a bit like when you're giving morphine in ED and you just give it in, you just give it as a f over five minutes and you sit there and you lift it. Right. Spontaneous rupture of membranes. Sometimes they will present to a maternity triage and say, my waters have gone, my waters have gone. There'll either be a very traumatic gush in Sainsbury's or something, or sometimes it'll just, they'll be like, I've noticed my pad is just a little bit wet and it's been wet all the time. I need to use a pad all the time. What's going on? But these women need to lie them down and do a speculum examination. I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, sometimes, like I said, when you go back to the anatomy, the urethral opening is literally just above the vagina. So if they have got incontinence, sometimes they think their waters have gone and actually they're incontinent. So this is why you need to do a speculum because sometimes the waters haven't gone. Sometimes there's just a bit of urine. Um, and sometimes they just, pregnant women tend to produce more discharge. And sometimes it's that, it's got nothing to do with their waters going and actually everything <coughs> everything's fine right so outpatient monitoring they if their waters have gone and they're not going into labor and they're not at term and maybe that's really really early then um you can they they really really need to kept, be kept in hospital because they can then go on to go into preterm labor if their waters so they then tend generally are kept for 24 hours if they're um waters have definitely gone and they're over 38 weeks and they're not going into labor and it's been over 24 hours we tend to induce them reason being that there's a risk if you imagine the membrane is like a protective layer against baby if waters have gone there is a risk of baby catching an ascending infection from the vagina so we don't tend to like women to have prolonged ruptures of membranes greater than 24 hours because of the risk of infection to baby so um if they have pre-prom, which is with their pre-term 
premature rupture of membranes, they are always become antibiotics, serithromycin for 10 days, and they're given um, outpatient appointments. Let me keep an eye on them. And just like I said, we're talking about, we don't want um, a baby to get an infection, but at the same time, we have to balance how things work out. We don't want baby to get an infection, but we don't want to deliver baby at 31 weeks, but we don't necessarily have to. Sometimes there's a small hole and they're leaking waters, but they're not, the whole membranes haven't gone. It might just be a small hole and baby continues and continues to produce lipos. So actually things can most of the time be fine, but in some of these women, you just need to keep an eye on them because if they start getting an ascending infection, you might need to deliver baby. It's about risk balance. That's just bearing in mind. So this is what um, it looks like when you do a speculum. You can see the bulging. That's what we refer to as bulging membrane. So you see in picture three, that's bulging, quite literally bulging down. That woman is uh, probably her water's already gone, but you might see this when you're doing a speculum for preterm labor. And actually you're thinking, oh goodness, this woman's cervix is definitely opening, isn't it? And so sometimes it looks like that. Sometimes you can even see a head, sometimes you can see hair, depends. So um, when you're doing a speculum, that's what it looks like. And you can see in picture two, um, what happens with bulging membranes, you can see essentially that's the cervix opening up. So other thing that we should mention is PIH slash pre-ET, so pregnancy-induced hypertension and um, preeclampsia. You will see this a lot. You will be sick to the teeth of raised blood pressure. Now, if you're coming from medicine, you're used to not really worrying too much about high blood pressure and you panic about low blood pressure. Obstetrics is very different. High blood pressure is always bad, always, always, always bad. And we have lower cutoffs because young women tend to have low blood pressure, they tend to have high blood pressure. So just bear that in mind. So signs and symptoms of um, PIH slash PET is headaches, visual disturbances. They sometimes say they're having blurry visions with spots in their vision, epigastric pain. And sometimes they just say, I don't feel quite well. Cerebral agitation, where they will get brisk reflexes and they might, before they're about to have a clampic, in clampic fit, they start twitching. We worry about preeclampsia because that's pre and then eclampsia is bad. They start fitting and they can, up, they can go on to have a stroke. So what we, what we classify as preeclampsia is proteinuria. So we do a urine protein creatinine ratio. Greater than 30 is preeclampsia along with raised blood pressure. Now, sometimes if they started with a booking blood pressure, so their normal blood pressure is 90 over 60, and now they've got a blood pressure of 140, that is high for them. That's not normal. So it might look normal. It might be, oh, well, and look at the blood pressure. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. But if they've got a booking blood pressure of 90 over 60, then they have really jumped. And generally, blood pressure goes down in pregnancy. It doesn't go up. So if you're worried, if you're seeing a blood pressure that is maybe 140 over 90 and it's got loads of protein in their urine, look at their booking blood pressure because it might be that their baseline is a lot lower and they're on their way up. So um, raised blood pressure without protein in the urine is pregnancy-induced hypertension. There's a difference between the two. So the sequelae of um, PET is they can go on to develop health syndrome, which is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes. Particularly, you'll start to see a rise in ALT. ALP is generally rise in um, pregnancy because the placenta releases an isoenzyme of ALP and that's completely normal but they, you'll get a rise in ALT things are going and starting to go wrong but there, there is no reason why a woman should be having a high ALT it's not normal at all there's something something's happening low platelets when that starts that's the process of health that's when things are starting to go really bad eclampsia is when they start fitting and that can then lead to a hemorrhagic stroke the central abruption is the other thing that we're concerned about. And placental abruption is where the placenta comes away from the wall of the uterus. And so usually it's family attached and mother supplies blood, um, blood to baby and supplies um, baby with nutrients. But when the placenta comes away, they then start hosing and hemorrhaging. All right. And preterm labor. It's well known that um, if you start having florid preeclampsia, you're more likely to 
literally quickly steps out of their email. So investigations, we do urine tip, like I said, send off the urine protein creation, creatinine ratio to the lab. So some hospitals will have a PLG, PIGLF, and essentially that's, it's a risk, it's a protein that you find in the in blood, and there's a risk stratification to say that basically if it's high and they've got raised blood pressure, so they've got PI hates pregnancy-induced hypertension, it tells you the risk of where they're going, and essentially if it's really high, you know they're going to develop um, great cancer. So if your trust do that, then it's something that you should send off. Um, if not, do bloods, liver function, uric acid, electrolytes, and full blood count. Some, um, and generally actually should really do a clotting function. For those women who are in florid um, preeclampsia, they then, then can go on to have um, DIC. So you should really, really always do a clotting function on them. Management. So if the blood pressure is borderline high, Depending on when you're trust, you might do different things, but generally for most trusts, they will do serial blood pressure monitoring and see what the blood pressure is doing. Because one of blood pressure sometimes doesn't necessarily tell you things. In the next five minutes, it could be over, it could be 160. So they tend to do a dynamap, which is serial blood pressure monitoring. Discuss um, any blood patient with a blood pressure of over 160 systolic, you really should discuss it with them. And antihypertensive treatment, treat it straight away. We want to get it down. We tolerate getting blood pressure down quite quickly as um, women. So give them a stat dose of libitolol, 200 milligrams. Unless they're a severe asthmatic, then you can start with nifedipine, a modified release, 10 milligrams. Just go for it. Um, if it develops after 38 weeks, most trusts will get you to induce the labor because the only treatment for preeclampsia, the only definitive treatment is to deliver the baby, get rid of that placenta. Reduce fetal movements. That's one thing to, um, you'll see a lot. Again, it's reduce, it's, so there was big, a big drive of reducing the stillbirth rate and that's saving baby lives documents. And if you're interested in that stuff, it's well worth having a read of it. But a lot of it talks about the association of stillbirth and poor neonatal outcomes with patients who would currently come in with reduced fetal movement. So baby, they'll say baby's not moving this well. In that situation, we have to screen them for risk, risk factors that increase the risk of um, risk of um, reduced fetal movements like polyhydramnios, IUGR, which is interuterine growth restriction, or small for gestational age. So these are babies that are struggling and they don't move because they're struggling. They are trying to preserve all their energy and trying to use it to stay alive. So movement is not necessarily what they're doing. In that situation, generally most trusts will have a um, reduced fetal movement guideline because it's quite, it gets quite complicated. Um, if it's over 39 weeks, most places will suggest that they have an induction of labor. Um, Generally, they were requiring um, an ultrasound. Most of the time, the midwife will request it, but sometimes you might need to do it. You do lipo volume, see how much water is around baby. Um, Doppler to see how what, what blood flow is like to baby and growth. If baby's not growing and they have having recurrent episodes of reduced fetal movements, this is something that needs um, a good look at by a consultant or registrar. And you can do growth scans. Um, it depends. If there are if they are a smoker, you should strongly encourage smoking cessation because there is a risk of um, small babies who don't do very well and women who are heavy smokers. Right. The one thing I will mention quickly is postpartum hemorrhage. So risk factors, labor dystocia, when they've had a long, long labor that we've augmented with syntosinone to try and produce stronger contractions, these women then can get really tired uteruses that don't contract and they have big bleeds. Um, prolong the second or third stage of labor. They've come in bleeding already. They have antipartum and hemorrhage. Again, they're more likely, oh, I don't know what's happening. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Sorry, there we go. Um, they're more likely to have um, a, a pa patients who come in with um, antipartum and hemorrhage are more likely to have PPH. This makes sense. Hemophilia, of course, because they're more likely to bleed. Sepsis. And a septic woman is more likely to bleed. Brand multiple, so women who've had loads of babies, again, they get big baggy uteruses that don't contract. Um, previous PPHs, 
um, big babies and antenatal anemia. So you can have a primary PPH, which is then and there after the woman's had a baby, or you can have a secondary PPH, which is over 24 hours after she's had the baby and she starts bleeding. Minor is less than 500 mils. Uh, well, I'm sorry, minor is greater than 500 mils and less than one litre. Uh, the expected blood loss for a woman, the normal, would be up to 500 mils. Um, moderate is one litre to two litres, severe is more than two litres, massive is greater than two litres. For causes, generally it's a bit like, you know, when you're um, doing recess and you do um, your ALS and stuff and they're like, oh, the four H's, well, up is 40s. Tone, trauma, thrombin, tissue. Tone, uterine tone, you want to get that uterus nice and contracted and well below their belly button. There are things that we can do for that. We can massage the uterus, get it down, or we can give uterotonics. So things like syntosamine infusion, syntometrin, um, misoprostol, carboprost. There's a, you, each um, trust will have their own guideline of how they like to do things. Trauma, if they've had a big tear and it's bleeding, repair the tear. Use your registrar will get down straight away on a PPH and go and do that. Thrombin, so if they've gone into DIC, those people who are septic, they are more likely to go into DIC, and those are the people who need FFP and things like that. That's something to wear. So you need to take a cot in um, when you're doing it. Tissue, if they've got a retained placenta, they are more likely to bleed. So we need to get that placenta out and make sure there's no bits of placenta left in there. So they might need to get up to theatre for an examination under anaesthetic. That's something to um, think about. If they're bleeding a lot, you need to activate the massive hemorrhage protocol. Um, if their uterus is not contracting and we give them everything, then we actually need to take them up to theatres, put in a battery balloon, or if it's in a section, do a D-Lynch suture, uterine artery embolization. Those are just those are things that are like way down the line. What you're going to be responsible for doing is getting in there, doing A, B, C, D, E, and giving them tranexamic acid because it will help reduce the amount of blood loss they have. And it will help with, and that's going back to the thrombin. When you do, when you start your obstetrics um, rotation, they will talk about obstetric emergencies and they'll cover all of this. I'm just making a brief mention of it so you're a little bit aware. And so just to round off, I'm going to talk about postnatal care. So most of you will have to go and do the postnatal review of the women through a day one section. So you need to look at what type of delivery they had. Was it an emergency C-section? Was it a planned C-section? Generally, if they've had less than two C-sections and it's not been a terrible C-section, they would be suitable to try for vaginal delivery next pregnancy. So if they ask you about that, that's what it is. What I would um, definitely recommend is looking at the op note because in the op note if they're not suitable to try and push out a baby again vaginally they will say so just bear that in mind into pregnancy interval recommend at least one year passes before they fall pregnant actually the um some guidelines say two years reason being that again women can um have an increased risk of stillbirth small babies and problems in their next pregnancy if they get pregnant too quickly. Contraception that you might consider desigestrol, depot injection of medroxyprogesterone or an implant. Lochia, that's the normal amount of um, loss from the shedding of the endometrium as soon as they've had a baby. If it's offensive smelling or a lot of heavy bleeding, then we need to think about secondary PPHs. If they've had a cesarean section, you always check the womb. Nine times out of 10 on day one, they wouldn't have taken off the dressing yet. So leave the dressing on. But if that dressing is soaked and full of blood, it needs to come off and you need to take a look at the wound and make sure that it's not breaking down. Suture removal. Most women will have dissolvable sutures, and, but there are some women, especially the big BMI ladies who need um, suture removals. Clips needs to come out. Proline clips are sometimes referred to as staples. Um, they need to come out and proline sutures also need to come out. The dissolvable sutures tend to be monoclonal or bicolor. Um, we, you're more likely to have a clot after you have a baby, so we always do a VT score and that will be there in your trust. And we give them that same for over 10 days or six weeks. Some women might not need it. If they've had an elective section, they have no risk factors, they might not need that. Pain relief, always give them. They've had a major problem with surgery, be nice. Um, constipation avoidance is a big thing. And they should always, like I said, go home with pain relief. Third and fourth degree tear repairs. If they've had a third or fourth degree tear, 
look at what type of delivery they have. They might have an instrumental delivery. They might have had um, uh, a normal vaginal delivery and just kind of really awful care. Um, again, for them, recommend contraception and uh, given a good interpregnancy interval, lochia, perineal care, vincoviti, constipation avoidance is a big thing in these women and they all need to go home with laxatives and antibiotics. Right, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. There is a lot and you're going to, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a big thing when you start and it's going to be quite frightening. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Always ask for help. Always, 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 always ask for help. And um, I'm more than happy to send my slides to anyone or um, if they want them, there's a, quite a lot of information I know and it was a very quick stop. But any, any worries, please um, drop me an email. My email is... and um, always ask for help. So in this slide, um, which I will um, pass over, I've also got a glossary of abbreviations, which will, might be quite helpful because Osingani is a bit like a different language sometimes. And so there are a lot of things that just people put loads of abbreviations and there's no way of you knowing and you're just like, oh my goodness, what does anything mean? You look at the label and it's awful. Um, but um, I've, I've put in a nice little glossary of um, abbreviations which you might find helpful. And um, good luck. Thank you very much, Dr. Falula. That was awesome and was a really useful insight into the speciality of Obsangaini and would help one to prepare for a job in it as an SHO or potentially a career within the speciality. Be on the lookout on our Medics Academy Facebook page for our future talks and make sure you join the FDOCS Facebook group. Be sure to check out our website also at medics.academy. Thank you very much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you all next time.